Good morning, class. This is the lecture for uh, April the 8th, Wednesday. If you're watching this on Wednesday morning, then uh, this evening at sundown is the beginning of Passover. So those of you who celebrate or observe Passover, I guess you celebrate it, right? Those of you who celebrate Passover, I like to say happy Passover, Chag Sameach. Uh, for those of you who are Christian, in my case, nominally Christian, this is Holy Week, and you will be celebrating Easter on Sunday. So I wish you all a happy Easter. I hope wherever you are, you have some people to share, I imagine it be your family, your family to share the holidays with. And these kinds of times, those kinds of little celebrations take on even more meaning. So I want you to, to get the most out of it and to think about it, and what it means to you and your family. All right, so today I'm going to talk about oil and water. We say they don't mix. And in the Middle East, they are crucial. I would say that the 20th century, the history of the Middle East is dominated by concerns over oil. That's what made the Middle East much more important in world history, world politics, international relations, than it would have been otherwise. Um, uh, it would have always had some importance because it's strategic location, but oil, of course, heightens the importance of the region. And I would say that looking forward to the 21st century, as we progress, water is going to be the, the key element. Now I'm going to break this lecture down uh, first in oil and uh, what the history of it, somewhat of its development. And then I'll go talk about the richest oil country in the Middle East, the Saudi Arabia and then talk about some of the knock-on effects of, of, of oil production, that is the large numbers of foreign workers and the impact that the foreign workers in the Gulf region, and here I'm gonna be using the Gulf, I'm sorry, the Gulf Cooperation Council, the GCC. It's on your list there. It is a organization uh, that was founded in uh, 1981 uh, by the Saudis, and it includes all of the Arab oil producers in the Gulf, except for Iraq. It's Kuwait, uh, Saudi Arabia, um, Bahrain, the island kingdom, Qatar, uh, the United Arab Emirates, and Oman. Um, Jordan, they have been thinking about asking Jordan, and at times Saudis have put forward the idea that Jordan and Morocco join, not because they produce oil, but because it's not only an economic council, it's also a defense council, and they have more robust armies. So clearly they would be useful to the, the Gulf states to help them protect their oil. The other possible candidate would be Iraq. Uh, and uh, Saudis have been very, the other countries in the, in the council have pushed for Iraq to join, but because of the fact that Iraq is a Shia majority country, Saudi Arabia has been very hesitant to allow uh, Iraq in. Um, because increasingly Saudi Arabia, which is dominated, I'll talk a little more about that when we get to the Saudi section, they've dominated the GCC and um, they have used it in the last five years basically as an alliance against Iran. So Iraq is, is questionable in the Saudi views. And then lastly, I want to talk about water and why water is such an important issue. Now I give you a lot of statistics here, well, not statistics, well, yeah, so you call them statistics, they're not and hardcore economic statistics, the way economists use. But at least they're, they are uh, statistics that you can, you can understand, and that is oil uh, reserves and production, and then uh, water reserves. And, and so I want you to look at those as, or at least I hope you look at them already, but at least look at them while I'm talking. So if you look at the list, you'll see that oil production is highly concentrated in the Middle East. Um, it's believed that the Middle East holds about a half of the world's known oil reserves. It is always changing. Um, just for example, I gave you the statistics I gave you from the US government and it gave Iran, it gave its, its, its known reserves in 2017 as uh, 211 uh, mil, uh, billion barrels. Uh, that's a way of conceptualizing a barrel of oil. I'm not actually sure how much oil is in a barrel of oil. I didn't look that up, but you, you've seen them. They're the big oil barrels that you'll even see in gas stations. That's what they mean when they say a barrel of oil. It's that measure. So the uh, Iran's 211 billion is actually larger. Iran announced um, 
last fall that they had discovered a new field with uh, 53 billion uh, barrels. Uh, similarly, Iraq is listed there as 142 billion barrels of reserve. Um, Iraqis continue to find new oil and the State Department estimates that they may have as much as 220 billion barrels of oil. Uh, the country that kind of surprised everyone in the, in the after 2011 was Venezuela. Before, before 2011, Saudi, if you had a list of countries that had the most oil, uh, Saudi Arabia would be the one with the largest reserves. But uh, in the early part of the 20, 2010s, uh, Venezuela came online, found a lot more oil. Um, and so it has jumped to the top. And then just to put aside Venezuela, you'll notice that it has years left at current level of production is 362 years, so like a lot of tremendous amount of years. That's because if you remember, uh, Venezuela is under embargo from the United States and several other Western European countries, and it's producing a minimum amount of oil these days. Um, there's not much market for their oil, uh, and so they are producing at a very low level, and that's why the, at the current level of production, they have an astounding 362 years to go before they run out. Now, um, some of the other issues that I said, new oils being found, new oils being found in the Mediterranean. So it's thought that uh, that eventually Lebanon, uh, Israel, Egypt, and Cyprus will prosper from the exploitation of these off-water, offshore oil wells and gas, more natural gas than oil that's found in the Mediterranean. So we're finding new sources, uh, but this gives you a rough idea and it shows you that the oil um, has been concentrated, was concentrated in the Middle East. And it, it, from the very beginning, it played a part in Middle Eastern history, just to take the question of Iraq. Is, um, remember the British had already started to exploit Iranian oil as early as 1908. Uh, and they knew, um, scientists and travelers knew that Iraq also had uh, oil. There's the northern town of Kirkuk, which is on the list I won't spell it or it's not on the list today because it was on the list previously on Iraq, cities of Iraq. Kirkuk is on a plain that's south of the, of the Kurdistan mountains. Uh, and it had natural had oil from going back to ancient times. And so the local people had bottled it. Uh, not necessarily before, well, but before bottling, they put it in you know, jars and had sold it as um, for lamps um, going back centuries. So they knew that uh, Kirkuk had potential for oil. It actually wasn't um, commercially brought online until uh, 1927, but the British knew that. And that's why they wanted, to, one of the reasons they wanted Iraq. And that's why, remember, Iraq was divided into three Ottoman provinces, Mosul in the north, Baghdad in the center, and Basra in the south. And the reason the British wanted Mosul in the north to be part of this new Iraq although originally the Sykes-Picot Agreement had given it to France, uh, was that they knew that they wanted to exploit the oil. Uh, Turkey uh, fought that. Remember, Turkey had come out of the war, uh, Lusan, uh, Eastry, uh, uh, victorious, and um, they had held out where the border on the south would be, and they continued to negotiate with the British until um, 1925, when they finally agreed that the Mosul province would be part of Iraq, and that then secured the Kirkuk oil fields for Britain. So the whole fact that we have a modern Iraq as a country, the boundaries of the country, were born out of Britain's desire to get control of the oil of Iraq. And then people would say, you know, we hear this continually, that the United States went to war in 1991 with Iraq, and then again in 2003, to get control of Iraq's oil. So oil has played a part in Middle East history and this to, uh, brings to mind the Middle East saying that when, or I should say an Arab saying, that when um, God created the world and made lands, he gave every land a curse and a blessing. So you might say, well, the curse of the Middle East is, I'm sorry, the blessing of the Middle East is oil and the curse then has been uh, uh, the lack of water. So I'll, Let's go back to the, is it a, is it a blessing? And um, you would say, especially if you're Iraqi, you'd probably say, no, it's not. It has caused all kinds of instability in their country because of the oil. It enabled uh, Saddam Hussein to launch his war against Iran 
in 1980. He was able to sustain that war uh, because he was selling off his oil. And then later when it became impossible to sell his oil because he was the only outlet Iraq has is the Shat al-Arab. Remember, that's that very narrow waterway that where the Tigris and the Euphrates flow together into the Gulf. That was pretty much mined by the Iranians, and the Iranians were on the other side of the border uh, as well. So at, at the end of the last few years of the war, Iraq wasn't able to export its oil, but Kuwait then would, would, would take it out of Iraq by pipeline and then ship it. And this was one of the, I didn't, mention it in the thing about the Iran-Iraq war, but this was one of the big developments is that the Kuwaitis were selling Iraqi oil uh, on ships bearing the Kuwaiti flag. And so then the Americans, I'm sorry, the Iranians threatened the Kuwaiti ships. And that's when the Americans came in and, and said that uh, if they attacked the uh, Kuwaiti ships, the United States would attack them. And that was led to the, the very tragic shooting down of an Iranian uh, civilian airliner in 1987 by the Americans. Uh, so uh, oil then is, is, is a curse, obviously, to many countries. Some would say that it enabled uh, Saddam Hussein to stay in power. He, even when I'll talk about the embargoes, the, when the embargoes were in place, he was still exporting or he was allowed to export oil. Uh, it has enabled the Iranians to do a lot of what they want to do. Although if you look at their, their listing there, you'll see that they also have seem to have a lot more years than they have, um, I mean, compared to other countries, given their reserves. And that's because they also face an embargo. So we go back to oil, Iran in um, pre-revolution days was uh, producing 6 million barrels of oil a day, 6 million. Uh, today, it has fallen down to less than 2 million a day because of the embargoes. Uh, there are only a few countries, uh, India, China, which will accept Iranian oil because of the American embargoes on it. So its production is very low. What is also ironic about Iran is Iran exports oil, that is raw oil, and imports gasoline. Uh, it, this is one thing that I've never had anybody explain to me sufficiently why it was that under the Shah's time, that they didn't build oil refineries. There are a few oil refineries down in the south, but not enough for what Iran needs. And what I was told was it was so cheap to import, it was cheaper to import finished petroleum ready to be used in cars than it was to refine it itself. So they sold their, their unrefined oil and they imported enough refined oil to run their automobiles. Now that has Created problems today. Iran continues to buy automobiles, has automobiles. You have to go to any Iranian city and they're just packed with cars. And they no longer have their, their capacity to, ref, to refine enough for themselves. And not only that, they have to import it. So that when they're faced with the imports of, of gasoline, they then have to, they've had several different periods the last few years where they've had to raise the cost of gasoline. And that has caused uh, demonstrations and unrest in the country. And it would, that would all be solved had they built refineries. Now they can't build refineries because they're under embargo. And most of the refinery technology is in the United States and Western Europe. So they can't build new refineries. Right? So they, they have, they're really caught in a weird situation. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia, by contrast, has plenty of refineries. Uh, they export both raw oil and gasoline. Uh, that was what the Iranians hit with their missiles uh, last fall, they hit the big oil refineries uh, part, well, complex is the word I'm looking for, hit the big uh, um, gasoline refining complex in eastern Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia does have the capacity both for, for uh, uh, shipping out raw petroleum, but also uh, gasoline. And that's why to this day in Saudi Arabia, gasoline costs only 25 cents a gallon, roughly 25 cents a gallon. Now, the other thing about oil production, it isn't just how much you have, it's, it's how much it costs to get it out of the ground and then what quality it is. So how much will it cost to refine? And so we, you look at the list and you, you see the United States, this is actually, I think, out of date by the US. We actually have higher uh, amounts than this um, because we continue to find shale with oil, uh, shale bearing oil. This is the whole fracking, you know, the whole, comp, uh, 
the, the disputes about fracking and the, the impact on the environment, the controversies that fracking uh, uh, and what fracking is is basically you send in to you send it below ground a process by where you disrupt the shale, you break it up, and you then the oil can be extracted, and that is most of the oil in Canada and most of the oil in the United States is now um, below is shale oil. So oil that's below, in, not only below the surface, but trapped in rock that has to be broken apart. So it's not in pools of oil underneath like they used to be. And still there are a few American oil, West Texas still has, and Oklahoma still have productive oil fields that are just the old fashioned way. But because the Americans, the, we need the high technology to get our, our oil out, oil needs to go at least 35, and most people say $40 a barrel for Americans to make a profit, for it to be profitable for the companies to extract the oil. And I don't know if in all this craziness with the, uh, our worry about the uh, pandemic, uh, there's also an oil war going on. Saudi Arabia is, is trying to punish uh, Russia and has lowered the price of selling its oil for about $21 a barrel uh, last time I looked. And why they're doing that is Russia, although they don't have to frack, they, it costs a lot to get it out because it's in, it's in the cold areas, permafrost areas. And also it's not as good quality. Saudi oil is the purest oil in the world, if you can talk about oil being pure. That is, it doesn't have chemicals and it doesn't have various other kinds of impurities uh, that have to be uh, filtered out. Uh, so for the Russians, the, the oil price, if it drip, drop, drops below $30 a barrel, they're in trouble. Saudis, by contrast, and I think this is also true for Venezuela. I don't have, obviously, since it's not my area of interest, I haven't paid as much attention to the Venezuelan oil, but Saudis, um, their oil is produced at less than $10 a barrel. So that even at selling it at $21 a barrel, they're making $11 profit for every barrel of oil they sell. So they have more flexibility in the, the oil price than any other country on earth. Um, and that gives them a lot of power. And then when you add that in with their allies, uh, especially Kuwait and UAE, which also have significant uh, resources, um, then the Gulf has, like I said, it probably, if you include Iran and Iraq, it probably has close to half of the known oil reserves of the world. So it, if long as people are using oil for automobiles, then it's going to be very important. And you have to remember that even when we, if we ever, the Easterners would say, God willing, if we ever reach a point where we don't you have to use carbon fuels anymore for for heating and for cars, we'll still need it for petrochemicals. So plastic, all plastic, sorry, all plastic was made from oil. And I, I just read an article, non-corona virus related and saying that we Americans who think we're recycling all this plastic, we're turning it in carefully. I'm, I know I have my bin I put out every two weeks with all my recyclables. Uh, in America, almost all the plastics are not being recycled. They're being dumped. So all of us who are being very conscientious about our plastic it really it's not really working. But anyway, we still need, we'll still need oil for plastic. So that will be a, even when, if I say God willing, we don't have to use carbon fuels anymore, we'll still be needing oil for petrochemicals. So that having been said, the, the importance of oil, I want to turn to Saudi Arabia. And uh, there is no question about it that Saudi Arabia is the kingdom that oil built. Uh, you could say that for all the smaller states, uh, Kuwait, um, Bahrain, UAE, they're, they're all have had a longer life than they would have had, uh, I just guess, if they had not been oil. In other words, had they just been monarchies in the desert, one would think that they would, especially during the Nasser era, then their militaries would have overthrown the kings in the same way that the military overthrew the kings in Egypt and in Iraq. And Saudi Arabia has been very much afraid of that all along of the fact that the army might act against it. And I'll talk a little more about that in just a minute. Right. So we have the house of, of Ibn Saud and I have them here on your, your, your sheet and I'll look at it just to remind myself. You have Abdulaziz Ibn Saud. So he is the, I don't know what generation removed from Muhammad Ibn Saud. Remember Muhammad Ibn Saud made an alliance with Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab back in the 18th century and that created the Wahhabi state. Well, they were hiding in the desert for most of the 
uh, 19th century. There's an oasis out near Riyadh, the capital. Uh, and that's where they basically hid out for the 19th century because the Ottomans were on the look for them. And uh, in the desert, they could continue and they started to build. They were very ingenious about building their, 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 they went to various oases and organized and they called themselves brothers. So the, the, there's the Muslim brothers that we've seen in Egypt, but they called this, these, these basically these uh, settlements that they, they established in various oases. Remember oases in, in Arabia are places where water comes to the surface and so you can have some agriculture palm trees and some if they're larger you can grow wheat and, and vegetables. So in these oases they settled men from various tribes and this was an idea that they, so the tribe break the power of the tribes by creating this new super tribe of the Wahhabis and so they, these were built um, over generations in Arabia and then after World War I, uh, Ibn Saud had been in correspondence with the British as, as well as had um, uh, Amir um, Abdullah in, uh, in, in Mecca. And so uh, the British were actually, the India office was corresponding with Ibn Saud and the Cairo office was corresponding with, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not Abdullah, Hussein, uh, uh, Hussein the Sharif of Mecca. And so Hussein then led the revolt, but after the revolt was over, Ab uh, the uh, Abdulaziz ibn Saud remained, emerged as a strong man. And he then uh, chased, uh, took Mecca, and, and um, uh, Hussein had to flee. The British gave him sanctuary in Cyprus, although they never let his son Faisal, remember Faisal, that British were propping up in Iraq. They never let them father and son get back together again. And then the other son, Abdullah, was king in Jordan. And they basically kept um, uh, Hussein under house arrest in Cyprus, where he died, I think he's 37 or 38. I mean, it's a nice house. I've visited it in Cyprus, uh, but it's a you know, modest house. And he wasn't allowed to get out of the, the garden, basically. Uh, but anyway, he was overthrown by Abdulaziz. Abdulaziz then married his way to power. He married the daughters of most of the prominent uh, tribal chieftains. Um, and he had uh, uh, numerous children. I think it's uh, 45 of his, his sons outlived him. And uh, then if you look at the list of, he, oh, I'm sorry, he, he officially fought his way, he conquered the various tribes uh, of Arabia. And finally in 1932, he was able to say that he had unified Arabia outside of places like Yemen and Oman and places on the Persian Gulf. But basically most of the Arabian Peninsula was under his control. And he established then the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And remember, he is the one then that gives the Americans the right to look for oil in Saudi Arabia. And they then discover oil and start to produce it in 1938. And that then becomes his source of wealth and puts him as a world. People are interested in what he has to say, Roosevelt, one of the last things Roosevelt did before he died is he came to the Middle East. They had a Cairo conference with Churchill and with Stalin, but they also, he met um, with uh, Abdulaziz. Abdulaziz, uh, the, the Americans sailed a, a battleship to Jidda, the port of, of uh, Saudi Arabia, and uh, the king went on the battleship and met the, met the President Roosevelt. So clearly that, and as I mentioned earlier, that was about the only country that Saudi Arabia had diplomatic relations with was the United States. And then Aramco, the American oil, Arab American oil company was the partly owned by the Saudi royal family and partly owned by a con, American stockholders. It was, had originally been Standard Oil and then it had uh, Standard Oil of, of I think California or maybe New Jersey, I don't remember which one, but it's one of the standard oil companies. And uh, so it had American stockholders. As I mentioned in the lecture on the, um, where we talked about the 73 war, uh, after the 73 war, the Saudis with a huge jump in oil. Remember it had gone from $2 a barrel to $10 a barrel. So just imagine, we're talking about $20 a barrel oil now. This was $10 a barrel in 1973 money which would be well over $100 a barrel in our money today. Uh, it had gone from $2 to $10, uh, so you know, five times the value. So money was pouring into Saudi Arabia, as I mentioned in the earlier lecture. And um, the Saudis had bought out Aramco. They had, it was largely owned by the Saudi royal family. 
Um, that's one of the reasons why they're so incredibly wealth, wealthy. They have well over trillion dollars um, in wealth, personally, not, not counting the country. Uh, and they, um, uh, they, they, they said in the fall they were going to open up for uh, public auction. In other words, they're going to sell stock first in Saudi Arabia, then on the world markets. It has sold some stocks in Saudi Arabia, but I think they postponed it um, largely because of the outbreak of uh, the, the virus in China in early 2000, uh, 2020. And so they put it on hold. Um, but you look then at the families and you'll see that, the, uh, that there have been six kings in Saudi Arabia since uh, Abdul Aziz. Abdul Aziz uh, died in 1953. And uh, all six kings have been sons of Abdul Aziz. All six of them. Because in Saudi Arabia, like a lot of Arab uh, traditions, you don't have primogenitor, it doesn't go to the oldest son, it can go to any of the sons and technically even any of the cousins. And so there has been a kind of understanding that the, the family, which numbers, uh, there's no, they, they're very <laughs> guarded on that. Uh, the estimates are there are probably about 5,000 people who are part of the Ibn Saud family. And so uh, the men of those fa of that family then get together and decide who will be the successor. And so far they have chosen brothers of, uh, uh, they've chosen, well, sons of Abdul Aziz. And currently we have Salman, who is the king. He came, became king in 2015. He is in his early 80s. And uh, you probably have heard of his son, who's now called Crown Prince. In Arabian tradition, Crown Prince then is someone who is the heir apparent. Um, they don't use that word crown prince, they use the word wali ahed. Um, but the wali ahed of, of Saudi Arabia is now Mohammed bin Salman bin Saud. So the media call him MSS, or what do they call him? Yeah, or is it MBA? Anyway, uh, I forget what initials they use. He is young, ambitious, in his early 30s. You probably heard about the uh, the killing of the Saudi journalist in Istanbul, um, Khashoggi, uh, that was probably put to uh, Prince Mohammed. I'll talk a little bit more about him in a minute. So Saudi Arabia then has been this family-run um, conglomerate. And why they were able to do that, and I mentioned this in the earlier lecture, is they made a deal with the religious establishment uh, so that the religious establishment would support them um, and then, you know, they would be able to do whatever they wanted. And they've also then, they maintain this, this alliance with the tribes that's very carefully maintained. Uh, in the Arab tradition, you have uh, meetings from time to time and the Saudi kings usually have it every um, Thursday uh, and anyone can come and petition. But of course you have to be a member of a tribe, not any old, you know, somebody. Uh, but most Saudis are tribal. And so the tribal leaders have been loyal to the, to the, uh, the Saudi royal family back to the army. The army, although a lot of the um, lower ranks are mercenaries, hired from other countries, the officer class is all drawn from the um, uh, tribal, tribal sons of the tribal leaders. And that was what the shock. I mentioned the, the 79 Mecca uh, when the mosque was taken over during the Hajj. And he was an army officer, Utebi. Um, and so uh, that was a big shock. And there have been some, you know, there's been some tightening of the military since then in Saudi Arabia. The other source of, of problem for the Saudis is something they don't like to talk about is that their oil is all in the Eastern part of the country. Uh, that part of Saudi Arabia, which borders the, the Gulf, because if you can imagine, it's near Iraq, it's near Iran. Most of the people who live in that area are actually Shia. And so the, Estimates are that Saudi Arabia is between 10 to 20 percent Shia uh, Muslim in its population. Uh, I'll talk more about that when we talk about I talk about the revival of Shia, Shia the political Shia political movement, uh, because that is a, a real concern to the Saudis that they have this potentially rebellious population. The same Bahrain is also a majority of its population is Shia. So during the Arab Spring, and I'll talk more about the Arab Spring in another lecture as well, the Saudis then, when the, there were demonstrations for greater uh, democracy or uh, for democracy, for parliament in Bahrain, Saudi quickly sent their troops into Bahrain to quell that because the 
if it were to be a majority ruled country like Iraq, then the Shia would take over in Bahrain. So that, that has been an issue for the, the Saudis. So the other issue that's in the news, um, have been in the news ongoing, is Saudi's uh, concern with um, uh, uh, Qatar. And why, why that came about is Qatar's family, it's called the Al Thani family. I put it on your sheep, I noticed I put it in lower cases, and it shouldn't be, it's, it should be uppercase. So Al Thani, the capital T-H-A-N-E, the Al Thani family has been ruling in, in Qatar longer than the Ibn Saud family has ruled in Saudi Arabia, but they're also Wahhabi. They have accepted the Wahhabi form of Islam. Now, so you would think, well, they would, should be natural allies, and they were up until uh, the, uh, the American invasion of, uh, I mean, the American war with Iraq, the first American war, and the, the Al Thani family decided to form a, a television station that would compete with CNN. Uh, most people in the Arab world were watching CNN to find out what was happening in Iraq. And the Althani family thought that that was terrible, that there wasn't an Arab voice representing what was happening in Iraq. And so the Althanis have been more militantly anti, well, at least diplomatically anti-American, although we have a very huge, this is what Trump found out when he wanted to, you know, say he, when he came to power or was elected, he said, well, I'm going to help uh, my friends, the Saudis. And then he realized, well, no, we can't really do that because we have our largest air base in the Middle East is in Qatar. So Qatar has this very anomalous position of having a, a, a television station, which is, you know, I wouldn't say anti-American, but definitely it shows the worst side of America. It doesn't lie, not a lying television station, but it is selective on what news it shows. And it, it uh, has been... It was a big supporter of the Palestinians, Intifada, which I'll talk about in another, another lecture. Uh, so what, when you're in the Arab world and you turn on the TV, there would be the top story, usually the news would be something about what the Israelis were doing to the Palestinians, either in the Gaza Strip or the West Bank. And then the second would be, this was all during the Gulf War and then during the, the American occupation of Iraq, the story would be about um, the American, what American atrocities had been done in, in Iraq. So the whole Abu Ghraib prison thing scandal was given a great deal of space. So you say, well, what, what, what can, the Saudis were kind of upset about this because they, they won, they're, they, they're very much tied to their alliance in the United States. But it really came to a head with the Arab Spring. And I'll talk more about this in uh, another lecture, but in the, when the Arab Spring began in 2011, the, uh, the Al Jazeera television picked it up and everybody with their smartphones would take videos of uh, what was going on and then they sent them via you know, mail to Al Jazeera and Al Jazeera would replay them. So all the, the news media reports that were about what the governments were doing to repress the people during the demonstration was being live fed to Al Jazeera and Al Jazeera would turn around and show it to the Arab world. And uh, the Saudis were feeling that the, they were encouraging rebellion, which might spread to Saudi Arabia. There were in fact demonstrations in Saudi Arabia in the Shia areas that I had mentioned. And then it also it came out that the Al Jazeera was supporting the Muslim Brothers, that, the, that they wanted the Arab states to move toward, remember they are Wahhabis too. And so although the Muslim Brothers aren't as doctrinaire as the Wahhabis, they're pretty doctrinaire in the sense that they want Islam to be the law of the land, no, law, no laws, there can be no laws that contradict the Quran. So for example, uh, you couldn't outlaw polygamy in a, in a state ruled by the Muslim Brotherhood, and you couldn't sell, legally sell alcohol. So uh, the uh, Al Jazeera then is supporting the Muslim Brothers, and Saudis have been very much against the Muslim Brothers, and you're going to say, why? And the simple answer is the Muslim Brothers, although they want Islamic states, remember they want it through the ballot box. They want political parties. They want people to vote. They do not, not want kings. They want presidents who are Islamic presidents and parliaments who are Islamic parliaments. So um, the Saudis had a break with, uh, with Qatar and that was the first kind of froze them out in 2014. And then the really big, big break came in 2017. Uh, and that's since 2017, they've had a boycott of Qatar. They've tried to encourage all their GCC partners to boycott Qatar. And so Qatar had brought most things in by land. It has a land border with Saudi Arabia that was closed. And so everything in Qatar had to be flown in. 
or brought in by ship. And they've managed to, to at first it looked like they were going to panic, but Turkey in particular, because Turkey's government is also Islamic and also has been sympathetic to the brothers. They flew in massive airlift of, of goats and, and sheep and other they live, pro, live animals and then agricultural products and produced products that would, um, that could keep the economy of Qatar. And so Qatar has pretty much survived the, the embargo. Um, okay, so that leaves Saudi Arabia. Uh, then I want to move to the next question and you'll, that's on the bottom of your sheet. You have this incredible number of foreign workers who are working in the Gulf. Uh, so this was from 2017 estimate and you'll see that it is uh, well over uh, 10 million people that are working in the, and by that we mean Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, um, Bahrain, uh, Bahrain not so much, but some in Bahrain, Qatar, Oman, and UAE. And UAE, the United Arab Emirates, which is a conglomerate of states, so they're the tribal states basically all get together. Uh, UAE, 90% um, of the people living in the UAE at present are not Emiratis. Emirati is what we call somebody from the UAE. They're not Emiratis, they are foreigners. All right, so it's a huge number. Now, how does this work? Uh, here I gave you the uh, kafala. Kafala is that uh, you cannot work in any of these countries unless an agency um, basically says that they will vouch for you. So you have to get a, a, a the whole big companies in India, Pakistan, uh, Philippines, which uh, sign up workers. They then vouch for the workers. They hold the workers' passports while they are in country. So the agents of the, the, the agency, agents of the company issuing the kafala for a particular worker, he holds her or his, because they're both men and women. Uh, the women work almost entirely in houses as, as domestics. The men work in almost any industrial job or any day labor job. So all construction is done by outside workers. Um, in the Saudi economy, over half of all jobs that are not, uh, half, well, most jobs are government jobs, but the, in the private sector, something like 90% of the, of, the of the jobs in the private sector are done by um, outside workers. The higher skilled jobs, the people do the computers and run the oil company, those could be um, European or Americans, the very top group. And then the next level is um, Syrians, uh, uh, Syrians mostly, it used to be Palestinians, but Palestinians because of the, the trouble with Israel, uh, especially after the, the first Gulf War when the United States, when the Iraq invaded Kuwait and the Palestinians were seen as sympathetic to the Iraqi army, the Kuwaitis kicked all the Palestinians out. Once the Americans had liberated Kuwait, all the Kuwaiti, all the Palestinians had to leave Kuwait and Saudi followed. And so there really aren't that many Palestinians working in the Gulf anymore. Those were taken, those places were taken up by Lebanese and Syrians. And so you have uh, two and a half million Syrians in 2017. That number is probably higher because of the war in Syria. Uh, and so uh, there are a lot of Syrians who are working there. But after that, you notice that it's, it's India uh, and Pakistan, Bangladesh. Well, those are the main, the, the Indian, South Asia are the main source. Uh, Sri Lanka also should is not a million, but it's high. Uh, those were brought in uh, from Bangladesh and from Pakistan. Uh, they're Muslims. India, they're both Muslim and Christian. Philippines, they're all Christian. Uh, so uh, the Saudis, uh, since Arab Spring, have been very uh, nervous about Arabs. And so, for example, Yemenis, uh, before Arab Spring, Yemenis had been a lot of the the day workers, the, the street cleaners, the construction workers, I come from Yemen and not from India, uh, in Pakistan, Bangladesh, they were Yemenis, because the Yemeni is the poorest country in the Middle East and it's a fairly populous country. So there are a lot of Yemenis who don't have work. And so they would come and work in Saudi Arabia. There were several million of them working in Saudi Arabia in 2011. Those have all been reduced and there are very few left. Uh, now Saudi Arabia is active in the Yemen civil war, so it doesn't trust Yemenis to come into Saudi Arabia, they were very severely limited. So we, they had to look to other places and South Asia then was the place where these, this was going on. Now, there's been a great deal of, of, of 
discussion. Uh, it's very hard to get out. Kuwait is probably the most open of these countries because Kuwait is, has moved toward greater democracy. It has a, a constitutional monarchy now. But even in Kuwait, people don't want, the Kuwaitis don't want to be, to be told. So I knew an a, 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 a Emirati woman uh, who was doing research on these foreign workers and, and she had a really hard time, even in her own country, the United Arab Emirates, she had trouble. Uh, in Kuwait, she had most access, but once they figured out what she was working on, because she was interested in how women in particular are being maltreated in these homes, uh, she got kicked out of the country. So they are very, they, they, there have been, uh, Al Jazeera has had some, and if you go on Al Jazeera online, English, Al Jazeera English, you might, there may, may be some stories that you can get. I'm definitely on YouTube. You may be able to get some of the exposés, but there have been some terrible uh, maltreatment of these people, um, domestic workers in homes, there have been rapes, there have been murders, uh, and then domestic workers, I'm sorry, the, the men who are building, for example, um, Qatar is going to host the uh, World Cup, and that has all been built by Kafala, workers, workers on Kafala contract, and they have been greatly abused. They can't complain because if they complain, then their contractors will send them, will take, give them, you know, they, they can't leave on their own. They can't leave the country without their passports. And um, so they're in real trouble. And if they complain, then they're shipped back. Uh, so they are badly treated. Again, a lot of them are being housed in um, metal containers, like you do for shipping containers. And you know, very badly ventilated and badly air conditioned, and, or if at all. So it's a terrible abuse. And so if we think of of our problem, not problem, our our existence of the large numbers of foreign workers who come to the United States from Mexico and Central America, uh, that they are the equivalent of what is in the in the Gulf. Uh, you know, and there have been, you know, especially this current administration, there's been a lot of shipping them back, but there hasn't been, you know, the cases of abuse are, at least we have a legal structure that is willing to try to help them if, if they need it. But in the, in the Gulf countries, that's non-existent, especially if they're non-Muslims. Um, they can appeal to the Muslim courts easily because the, a Muslim court will almost always favor a Muslim over a plaintiff who is a non-Muslim. So it's one of the reasons why non-Muslim Indians, for example, are preferred by most of these kafala over Muslim Indians. Um, and so there is a, that's a, a key issue, and that will continue to be an issue. Saudi Arabia is trying to, under Prince Crown Prince Salman, uh, I'm sorry, Mohammed bin Salman, he uh, two years ago tried to uh, end the kafala system in Saudi Arabia, and he but it wasn't because he was a humanitarian, rather is he wanted Saudis to go to work, and he that is one of the reasons he has relaxed the restrictions on women. He has wanted women to go to work in, in office jobs uh, so that you don't have to have foreigners doing the work. Uh, men, he wants men to go to work. Uh, and so he has uh, uh, tried to replace the foreign workers. But even now, we guess, again, that's a guess, that Saudi Arabia it has a population probably close to 30 million. Of that 30 million, 5 million is still foreign workers. Uh, so it, even Saudi Arabia, which has the largest population of these countries, it still um, has not, uh, it still relies heavily on them. All right, so I think that's pretty much all I want to say about oil, um, other than it has created monsters in the region, if you want to look at it that way. I mean, the, it's given a great deal of wealth to a small number of people uh, in countries like Iran and Iraq. It has allowed dictatorship governments to persist. Uh, in Syria, for example, Syria didn't have much reserves. They started to discover some oil in the 1960s and 70s. And that pretty much now has all been played out. There are a few, and that's one of the you know, things America is still protecting is the oil wells in eastern Syria. Um, it's pretty much played out, but it allowed for the Syrian government to maintain its dictatorial rule through the 90s, enrich the ruling the elites, the Alawis, got tremendously wealthy off this, and it then helped them maintain their civil, the, their their forces during the um, the civil war, the ongoing civil war. So, in you go back to the old saying that every country has a curse, 
and a blessing or a blessing and a curse. And you could say, well, maybe in the Middle East, the, the blessing was also a curse, that there are very few examples. Uh, Kuwait is probably the only one I can think of where the population was significant enough um, and uh, that the wealth could have been uh, used, uh, was used well enough to give everybody a pretty good standard of living. But the point, the problem there was eventually everybody uh, wanted to be, have someone work for them. And so that, you know, they have had to bring in foreign workers, not because they have to, it's just because Kuwaitis have gotten used to it. And it probably shouldn't surprise us then that the countries with the greatest obesity in the world tend to be these oil producing countries. They are incredibly obese. And if you look at the list of, of countries where obesity is a problem, uh, the, the Gulf countries are far ahead of any place in the United States or Western Europe. All right, the last one I want to leave, leave you with that just kind of jumped to my mind is Libya. Libya was, is a very well, it isn't on this list because I, I'm concentrating on Middle Eastern, not North African, but Libya has a huge amount of oil. And one of the ironies about Libya is that had Gaddafi decided to use the oil in the way that Kuwait did, and Gaddafi, remember, is the dictator who was overthrown by Arab Spring in Libya. Had he decided to create a welfare state for his population, he probably could have avoided the Arab Spring. Kuwait did. Um, Bahrain had problem because of the uh, Shia majority. Saudi had some problem, but they just started giving out more money and they, they closed down Arab Spring really quickly in Saudi Arabia. Uh, and they gave money to Jordan. They helped Jordan close down the, its, its demonstrations. Uh, so uh, money could buy out discontent. And Libya didn't. I mean, I, I saw a shocking, I remember thinking about this back in 2011, the, the average income of the average, I mean, the average income of a Libyan was less than $2,000 a year. Compare that to Saudis and Kuwaitis, which is well into the 20, 30, 40,000. I don't have it in front of me, but it's, it's high. It's, it's Western European. American levels of, of wealth that the individual uh, Kuwaiti and Saudi citizen has. Uh, Libya, no. He just put it in the bank. He bought weapons. Um, he didn't exploit it quite to its full content, I mean, ex extent possible. And you just think, well, what was going on in his mind that he did not use that oil wealth to keep himself in power? And so he fell. And that, that maybe that's a lesson to the Saudis and the Kuwaitis and the others that they they should spend as much as they need to to keep the standard of living high enough that people won't protest uh, the fact that they have no political freedoms. All right, so then I'm going to turn from that. And if you do have questions, please email me about them. And then turn to what is really striking, and that's statistics on water. And they were bad before people started to do predictions on uh, global what will happen if the world continues to uh, use carbon-based fuels the way we have been. And the predictions from the uh, United Nations is that by 2050, the worst impacted areas of the world for global warming will in fact be the Middle East, much worse than South Asia, which is bad, much worse than Africa, which is also bad, much worse than, you know, a lot, almost every place on earth. I, I would have thought Central Asia, Central Asia was separated out. Uh, Central Asia is better off. It, it's going to be under severe, but it's not super severe. The Middle East is super severe. And if all you have to do is look at the water ratios. And to think about that, you think, well, what is the source of water? In most parts of the lucky world, that is, and here I really recommend you go to Google and look at some maps, global maps uh, of, of uh, satellite photography, the ones that show you what the world actually looks like, not elevations. Elevations give you a false sense of, for example, Saudi Arabia looks very green because it's below, it's very flat in many places. Um, but look at ones that show you the um, geographic, um, uh, what it actually looks like from, from space. And you'll see that there's almost no green in the Middle East at all, other than the Nile Valley, then the coast of uh, North Africa. Um, most of Turkey looks relatively green, and then the coast of uh, Syria and Lebanon, and then the Tigris and Euphrates valleys. Iran is remarkably brown. I, you know, I never thought about that because it's a big, has a large population. Uh, and, um, but when I was in Iran, 
um, three years ago, I flew from southern Iran, the city of Shiraz, to Tehran. It was early, uh, well, morning. The sun had already risen, but it was early morning. And it was a perfectly clear day. So the flight was about three hours. I didn't see any green looking out the window. I had a window seat looking out the window. I did not see any green until we got to Tehran. So that's a big brown country. Um, the reason they have survived is they have, if you look on the map of Iran, there are uh, the mountains, the Zagros Mountains. Most of the towns of Iran are at the basin of those mountains. So water runs off from there. There are other places in Iran, such as the city of Yazd, which is is out in the uh, western part of the country, I'm sorry, the eastern part of the country, um, and that has oases. So it has oases uh, like the rest of the Middle East. So that's groundwater. That's water that was you know, created in the Ice Age or earlier. And that gets used up. And once that's used up, that's all there is. So the Middle East, if we talk about water renewable, that's where the list of renewable uh, figures uh, show you is, um, gives you the figures of how much comes in every year uh, by rain, basically. When we're talking about renewable, we're talking about rain. Uh, and you see that the, the only country that um, is, is, has enough is uh, Turkey. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's close. It's close to being in trouble, but it's, uh, it has enough um, for what it uses. Um, in fact, a lot more than what it uses. It gets in uh, renewable fresh water. It gets in, what is this, the 234 uh, square kilometers per year, cubic kilometers per year, and it uses uh, 39.8. So it's a net, it has a net surplus of water. Uh, it, you see it's the only country other than uh, Egypt. Egypt has net, uh, Iraq has net, uh, Syria has net, uh, Lebanon has net amounts, but almost everybody else, and especially Israel, Jordan, uh, Kuwait, Saudi Arabia, uh, they're all, and Iran, Iran has, is, has some net as well. Um, they're all uh, countries that uh, are in trouble. And if you look on the C chart, it shows you how much in trouble they are. And so you say if the country uses 40%, um, uh, that's okay, that's good. If it's more than that, it's bad. And so what you see is that Kuwait is in a very bad situation. Uh, Saudi Arabia is in a very bad situation. Even Israel's in a very bad situation. And Jordan, uh, Egypt, uh, uh, Iran, uh, Iraq, Syria, they're closer to being okay. And Turkey's not even on the list because it's not a problem. The same as uh, Lebanon. Lebanon's not a problem. So the only three countries that are really water secure are Turkey, Lebanon, um, and Syria. The others are dependent on especially Egypt and Iraq. Uh, have enough water as long as their rivers are flowing. And that then is one of the issues that uh, I want to talk about at the end, that is damming of the rivers. Uh, and so uh, water is going to be a problem. And you say, well, all right, you, you have two, two ways. You take your groundwater, but that'll run out. And all of the countries that we've listed as, as, as problematic, including Israel and Jordan, uh, but all, Saudi Arabia and Kuwait as well, uh, the water's going to run out uh, in our lifetimes. Uh, so what do you do? And then the obvious answer, if you think about it, is desalinization. That is, you develop the technologies to, to clean dirty water, and that will, uh, salt water rather, seawater, and that you can drink. Uh, most of these countries are high advanced in the same way the Southwest. I spent I was in uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and I was very surprised by these brown, people kept talking about brown water, you know, living in New England, you know, no idea what brown water is. Well, brown water, for those of us, for those of you who don't live in a, who do live in a, a lovely place like New England or the Midwest or the Southeast, where you have plenty of water, is when you take your, your sewage water and you do not use, you find it not for drinking water, but for other uses. So watering lawns and things like that, industrial uses. And that's called brown water. So California and the Southwest has been using that for 
long time. And I think Americans probably were the first to develop that. Well, that's also highly developed in Israel, uh, Jordan, uh, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait. And those countries spend a lot of money developing technology uh, for that use of groundwater. And then the alternative would be desalinization. And Saudi Arabia has spent huge amounts of money on desalinization. And uh, they are confident that when they run out of groundwater, they can go entirely to desalinized water. But clearly that's not an option for poor countries. Uh, and so water will be a problem and the sources of water will be a problem. And we see that already in conflicts that are, that are developing in the region. And here, let's talk a little bit about dams. So in the Middle East, there are really only three major rivers. The Nile, which flows out of Africa. There are two Niles. There's the, what's called the White Nile. But the source is Lake Victoria, which is which where, let's see, Uganda, uh, Congo, uh, and uh, Tanzania. Uh, and the, what's called the Lakes region. So it's Lake Tanganyika, Lake Victoria. So it's, those, it's Rwanda, Burundi, uh, Congo, uh, Uganda, and uh, Tanzania. Uh, and Kenya, I can, you know, have trouble picturing where Kenya is exactly on, on the lakes, but I think it also has part of the lake. So anyway, is that the rainfall from tropical Africa then flows out uh, uh, north because it's flowing uh, where the, from high to low, highlands of, of East Africa down to the lowlands of Sudan and then out the Mediterranean in Egypt. That's called the White Nile. The Blue Nile comes from the, the mountains of Ethiopia. So the excess tropical rain in Ethiopia uh, flows again from high to low. So that's from most places we think of as north as, uh, from north to south. But there are rivers who flow uh, from south to north. In Europe, the Rhine River, for example, flows from the south to the north. Um, but in Africa, then the Nile flows from the south to the north. It, the, the water that is produced in the tropics flows to the Mediterranean. Uh, the Blue Nile then meets the White Nile at Khartoum, the capital of Sudan, North Sudan now. Uh, and that's why Khartoum is there, because it's where the two rivers flow. And I've been there, and it's really, we call the Blue Nile and the White Nile. And it's true, they are. They're actually, the White Nile is white because it has a lot more sediment in it. The Blue Nile has come not as far, and it's come much faster. It, you can actually see it when they, they join together. So there's this blue water on one channel and then this white water on the other. And they hit it at Khartoum and they turn more and more white. It's, not, it's, it's a lot less blue once it leaves Khartoum and goes north. So it shows you the volume of the water is much more heavily from the White Nile um, than from the Blue Nile. So the Egyptians have built their dam at uh, Aswan and that was a major accomplishment of the Nasser period. And there's a problem. One, it's silts, um, so they have to worry about. The other is evaporation, that when you build a, a dam and you have a big lake and you're in the desert, that it, the rate of evaporation is high. So there always has been a problem, both with how do you control the silt and how do you, um, you know, regulate for the your evaporation. And as I mentioned earlier on Egypt, it didn't, ending the flood has meant that Egypt needs to uh, use a lot more Phosphates as fertilizer didn't used to use any chemical phosphates at all because the Nile flood would bring the, the topsoil of Africa down on top of Egypt. And as a result, since the, the Nasser period, the Egyptians have been heavily using phosphates. That flows out into the Mediterranean, and that has basically killed off most of the fishing stock that used to be in the eastern Mediterranean. Uh, dead zones. Uh, the fish, there are still fishermen. They catch stuff both from Israel, from Lebanon, from from Gaza Strip and from Egypt, but it's paltry what they used to catch. They used to catch, you know, a huge amount of fish uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. That has almost all died out because of the phosphates that are being used as um, replace the, the silt from the Nile flood. So that's the first of these dams that was built. And uh, that didn't give a lot of problems uh, because Sudan didn't have that many needs. And Egypt uh, helped Sudan both with electricity from the high dam and then also uh, uh, water um, for irrigation. Uh, but Ethiopia now, Ethiopia is uh, emerging as a, a major, uh, you know, it's an industrializing country. It's a, 
developing country and its, its population is growing fairly dr dramatically, about 100 million people, I think, has been has. And so they thought, well, let's dam the Blue Nile. We, we could use that. We could use it for electricity to help our progress. And so they have had plans to build a dam. They are building a dam, I should say. They have had plans for a long time, and they're actually building it now. And it's supposed to be completed, I think, in, do I have it down here when it's completed? I've done it 20. Uh, do I have? Uh, 2011. All right, they started it in 2011. And in 2019, it is 70% um, complete. Uh, and they, it will take five to 15 years once it's finished to fill up. So what the Egyptians are worried about is that five to 15 years. Now they, all three countries, Sudan, Egypt, and uh, Ethiopia have a treaty on how much water they can take out of the Nile. Well, obviously it's, it's Sudan and Ethiopia. And it favored Egypt because Egypt was the most um, populous country and also had the strongest government uh, dealings with the Ethiopia and Sudan. Um, but Ethiopia has been pushing for the right to build this dam, and it was granted by the United Nations and various international organizations. And the uh, United States initially also supported it. Um, but now that uh, you know, uh, President uh, Trump has close relations with President Sisi, they've, Americans in the last couple of years have started to take Egypt's side. But it's still a negotiation. And so it's not really the, the it, it is the transition period that it, the Egyptians are worried about. They, they tend to say, well, they're going to take water from us, we're going to get the water. But once the dam is, the lake is filled, there will be no reason for the, the water will have to flow out. Otherwise, there'll be floods in Ethiopia. So it'll go back to normal. So it's that transition period. And the Egyptians are worried that that will mean more silt in their dam, uh, the Aswan. It means that their electricity supply might be cut. Most world experts are saying, no, there's no no real evidence that the Egyptians are overreacting uh, to this. Um, I don't know. I'm not a scientist. Uh, no, I don't know what happened, but I do know that there there was threats. Uh, Sisi made a threat a year ago that he would blow up the dam. Uh, so there, there, it is a place where there will be tension over water. I said at the beginning of this class that water is going to be a a place where there'll be tension in the future. Another place there'll be tension is Israel and the West Bank. Uh, the Israelis are already taking 90% of the groundwater, uh, most of the groundwater in between the Mediterranean and the, the Jordan River uh, lie in the, the hills of the West Bank, underneath the hills of the West Bank. And so the Israelis are taking 90% of the groundwater of the West Bank for their consumption, uh, leaving 10% for the Palestinian Authority. And that's going to run out. I don't know what the years are, but I think it's no more than 50 years that will run out. So there's going to be tension there. There's tension uh, between Jordan and Israel over the, the, uh, the Jordan, although the water itself isn't that uh, important, but it is, it is salinizing because the, uh, both the Sea of Galilee, which had fed, I'm sorry, not both, the Sea of Galilee, which feeds the, um, the Jordan, is getting more and more salty because of runoff of, of agricultural production in Israel. Uh, and to some extent, Jordan, not so much Jordan, but more Israel mainly. And then the sources of the, of the Sea of Galilee are all in Lebanon. And so there is a potential for the Israelis then to move in and occupy southern Lebanon like they did earlier, um, this time for water reasons. Uh, so that's a, a real hot spot. Um, the other hot spot is, uh, well, Syria during the Civil War. Syria's main dam is the on the Euphrates. It's called um, the Tabaka. So that's the place it is. It's called, called the dam itself. It's called Revolution Dam. They quit calling that during the, the the uprising. So it's now just called the Tabaka Dam because that's where it is, the town of Tabaka. And then the lake is is called Al Asad Lake. And I don't know what the revolutionaries call Al Asad Lake, but it, Al Asad Lake was the lake and. That had, as I mentioned, had a great deal of uh, benefit in Syria because it allowed for irrigation of uh, of uh, land that was uh, in the valley of the Euphrates that was fertile but didn't have enough water naturally. So Syria had a real wheat boom in the late late 90s and early 2000s, and I'll I'll talk about that when I get to the, the 
the uprising in Syria because Syria experienced a drought in the three years before the, the uprising began. Uh, so uh, the Tabakli Dam had a beneficial for Syria. Clearly, it gave electricity for Syria. Syria, basically, if the population wasn't growing as fast as it was before the, the Civil War, uh, it was self-sufficient in water. It was in the eastern part of the country where people were starting to use irrigation uh, to farm that they needed the water. But it also then meant the Tabakli Dam limited the flow into Iraq of the Euphrates or not limited, but cut down on it. And then the Turks have been building dams. The headwaters, that is the waters that feed both the Tigris and the Euphrates River, which are the lifeblood of, of Iraq, in the same way that the Nile, without the Nile, there'd be no Egypt. Without the Tigris and the Euphrates, Iraq would be like Saudi Arabia. It'd be a desert country with oil. So um, Iraq is an agricultural country. And so it needs the water that comes from the Tigris and the Euphrates to feed its population. And the uh, Turks have been actively building dams. They started with Ataturk, they built the Kevan Dam uh, on Euphrates, but very actively in the 90s and the 20s, after, especially after we mentioned the IMF, the deals with the IMF and Turkey opened up to the world, it began a very extensive program that's just called the GAP project, like GAP stores, G-A-P. And that stands for Gunaydu uh, Anadolu Projesi, which in English then is the Southeast Anatolian project. So GAP, the GAP project. And what they're doing is both on the tributaries to and on the Tigris and the Euphrates, they're building a series of small dams. So it's like the Tennessee Valley Authority system in the United States. Um, it's extensive damming, not any major large dams. The Kaban Dam is the largest dam and it's more like, say, the, the Hoover Dam on the Colorado. It's not even that big, but it's, it's, a, it's a significant dam. The others are more like what you find if you're from the southeast. You, you've seen these dams all across Tennessee, uh, North Carolina, uh, northern Georgia. And these are the part of the Tennessee Valley Authority damming. And so the Americans and the Turks have always worked close together. And so American technology and engineering, and the, you know, the idea of the GAP project is in fact the mirroring of the Tennessee Valley project. Why well, I'm saying that it's a lot of little dams. And so it's making a lot of little lakes. And what the, the Turkish government, it's in the Kurdish region. And what the Turkish government has argued to the outside world is that this will enrich Southeast Anatolia. It'll, it'll bring up Southeast Anatolia to the standards of the rest of Turkey, which are relatively high, as I mentioned in the lecture on the the transition from military to the more democratic after the 1980 coup, Turkey went through a real boom, economic boom. Uh, but there's real disparity. The you know the the income, average income of people in Western Turkey is more like twenty thousand dollars a year. In southeastern Turkey, it's more like five thousand dollars a year. And so there's a, a great deal of poverty in the southeast, and that's also the Kurdish region. So that's the region where the Kurds have been active in the PKK. And so the Turkish government has argued that the building of the dams will raise the economic levels of Southeast Turkey. That will, that will give more agriculture, the, there'll be more water for irrigation, be more electricity. Uh, it'll be good for everybody. Uh, the, you know, the backstory is it also means more control of the Turkish government in these regions where the Kurds are active. Uh, and it also means flooding of historical sites. And that's been one of the, the big issues. There's a town, I didn't put it on the list, but I think you probably Google it. Uh, well, it's called Has Uh So I think in English or in Turkish, it's spelled H-A-S-H-A-S-A-N-K-E-Y-I-F, Hasankeyev. It's a Kurdish town uh, on the Tigris. And it was a site of great deal of, of uh, archeological, especially from the Roman period, the beautiful, beautiful mosaics. And that's all going to be lost by the dam that they're building there. And so already the town has flooded and it was a beautiful old town. I mean, very lovely, one of the most lovely towns in Southeastern Turkey. And they've moved it up above the lake where the lake will be, but it didn't, you know, they moved a few of the buildings, but it, it, it was, you know, with narrow streets, stone houses, very lovely courtyards, gardens. Uh, and that all will be submerged underwater the same way that a lot of Tennessee was submerged underwater by the, um, Central, the Tennessee Valley Authority. So that's been one of the, the big debates on that. So water will be an issue because Iraq and Syria will, as Turkey dams more and more water, will that mean that they'll have to, you know, will there be trouble on the borders? 
what the, the role of Kurdistan. Kurdistan controls a lot of the headwaters that go into the Tigris and Euphrates. So water is expected by those people who make those kind of predictions. Like I said, I don't make those predictions. I'm a historian, not a predictor, but it does seem that of all the regions in the world, uh, the Middle East is the most water stressed. Um, uh, and the last thing I wanted to draw your attention to is, is drinkable water and that, uh, oh, see I left out Iraq, that's too bad. I, the rack is 80% and I'll go. So what we have seen is though most of the developing world does not have access to clean water. The Middle East, because they're in the middle level of the developing world, you'll notice almost every Middle Eastern country has uh, pretty good access to drinking water. The one that wasn't, it was Iraq, it was only 81%. And that is because the United States, um, during the bombings of Iraq, uh, a lot of their infrastructure was destroyed uh, and then during the embargo, they weren't able to rebuild it. And then during the ongoing troubles in Iraq, they haven't put their, haven't put much money into their infrastructure. Uh, under Saddam Hussein, before the first Gulf War and before the bombings of Iraq by the United States, Iraq was pretty much uh, 98, 99% um, had access to drinking water. So it doesn't, um, in, this, in this case, the Middle East isn't like Sub-Saharan Africa. It's not like South Asia. It's more in the level of, of Southeast Asia and uh, uh, Mexico um, and, and uh, South America. So it, it is most, most people living in the Middle East have access to clean water. The problem is how much longer will they have access to water at all? And in some of these countries, it's gonna come sooner rather than later. So that's a kind of a dismal thought to think about on, on a happy weekend that has both Easter and Passover. But it is something I think your generation needs to think about that, again, a push for um, more global justice, the push toward um, saving the environment. Uh, it has not just, you know, for your particular environment, but it also, it has an impact on the world and countries' relationship with each other, that if countries that are starved for resources, um, they're going to be the ones that are going to be much more aggressive than the countries that aren't, the lucky countries. So I, you know, the oil, you know, will no longer, I don't think increasingly won't be a major issue in the Middle East. Um, the, well, it's, let's just put it, today it is for India and China in particular, those are the countries that are most dependent on Middle Eastern oil. The uh, United States imports oil because we import the high grade Saudi oil I mentioned, but we are a, a net exporter of oil, at least for now, now that the oil price has dropped. That probably won't be so until it goes up again because it just isn't profitable for the oil producers in the United States to continue fracking to get that oil out of the shale. Um, so we would have to import more. And the last thing I wanted to, to I didn't mention it, I looked in the, on, on my list here, but I didn't provide it to you on the notes. And let's go back to the foreign, um, the, percentage of people that are, are working uh, in the various countries. I gave you the number, uh, but I didn't give you the remittances. So for example, the, uh, the, two of the three of the largest countries in the world for remittances in the middle, well, from oil medicines from the Middle East, the, Mexico is one of the largest in the world, um, and uh, uh, then Guatemala, El Salvador, the countries of Central America, they are some of the largest countries that are that are benefiting from remittances. That is the percentage of their GNP that comes in from outside. But just to give you some from the Middle Eastern countries, uh, for India uh, in 2017, uh, $63 billion came into India from Indian workers in the Middle East, the GCC countries, uh, 21 billion uh, in 2010, so it's much higher now, but in 2010, it was 21 billion into the Philippines. Uh, in 2020, it was three, or sorry, 2019, it was three billion into Jordan. So uh, those three countries in particular, Egypt also um, gets about $5 billion a year from remittances of Egyptian workers in the GCC countries. Uh, Yemen, it used to be the major source of their GNP when Yemen workers went to Saudi Arabia. So that trend, the transmission of funds from these workers 
is a major part of a lot of these economies of these less developed countries. And that also, I mean, that also, I mean, we know it from our own case of the, of the foreign workers working in the United States, but it also then is a, an issue for the foreign workers working in the GCC. And those then two are the two major places. Western Europe also has lots of foreign workers, um, although they are more regulated. And so in Western Europe, the foreign, oh, sorry, <clears throat> the foreign workers largely come from the EU. So there's free movement of EU citizens. Uh, so the foreign workers in um, Europe, Western Europe, are largely from countries like Poland, Bulgaria, Romania, poorer countries in the EU. Um, so there, they don't have the large numbers of uh, outsiders, technically outsiders. EU people are all technically insiders. So um, they, they don't have them. Um, Britain, we'll see, is with its uh, leaving the EU, that's going to be a major problem for Britain. This is where they're going to get their foreign workers. All right. So I will leave that, leave you here. I wish you all a happy holiday if you're celebrating it. And I hope you're staying well. And I hope your weather is turning to spring like it is here in Connecticut. We're actually, I always look forward to the coming of spring. The robins are back. The, the lilacs are already budding. So the daffodils are up. So uh, the campus has never looked more pretty. I'm just sorry you're not here to see it. So I'll say goodbye to you for now and I'll be talking to you soon. Mm -hmm.